But we're going to see that God breaks silence here after 400 years. Remember, there was 400 years when they didn't hear anything from God, the Jewish people. And then God breaks the silence. And he, he comes and he, he speaks to Zechariah in the temple. So Zach and Liz, as we'll call her, hear from God first. And then six months later, Mary and Joe hear from another angel named Gabriel. Now, remind, I want to remind you, these are just ordinary, imperfect people just like us that God came to and spoke to. God was moving. 30 years later, he would speak again when Jesus was baptized. Now, the religious leaders of that day there in Israel thought everything was fine. And they didn't expect that God was going to interrupt their system. And sometimes we can get in the habit of going to church and doing the right things, doing the expected things, and figure that everything is okay with our lives. But sometimes what we really need is just for God to break through. To break through into our lives, to open our eyes, to challenge us again, right? Because we can just kind of get lackadaisical, things can be status quo, but when God comes, everything changes. And God does this here with Jesus' birth. You might ask the question, well, why then? Why did he come then? And simply Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. In other words, it was the time according to God's timetable. Religiously, culturally, politically, it was God's plan. We know there was a road system. We know there was a common language. A lot of things came together for God to do what only he could do. You might say, well, I, don't, I just don't understand. But we need to remember that God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And beyond that, God's timing often is not our timing. And we've all experienced that, haven't we? We thought it should happen like this. We thought it should happen now. And God says, no, not right now. I want you to wait. I want you to be patient. I want you to simply trust in me. The examples in this Christmas story are, of course, the parents of John the Baptist. Elizabeth, as you may remember, was barren. Zachariah and Elizabeth had been praying for kids. It seemed like forever. Now they are well advanced in their age beyond the time when they would expect to have children. And then God shows up. And God chooses in his timing to cause Elizabeth to conceive and to bear a child. And we know him as John the Baptist. And God's timing is fulfilled. Then we come to Mary, who is only engaged. She's still a virgin. And the question is, how will she conceive? She's a righteous girl who's been keeping herself pure. But God will accomplish his perfect plan in his time. We saw over and over again last night that took place. God fulfilled his word. You know, sometimes we pray, God, if you would just show me your will. I just want to know what your will is, God. I really want to hear from you. But then when he answers, our response is sometimes, what? You mean me? Now? This isn't what I was expecting, God. And this doesn't really fit into my plan. Right? How often have we responded to God in that way? And I'm sure that some of those thoughts were running through these folks' minds <laughs> that we just addressed. What is happening? Why now? Why did you, why did you wait till now, God? But again, God has perfect timing. God comes. God does what he does on his plan and not ours. And so we can have confidence in him. So this morning I want us to see, first of all, God's will revealed. And then I want us to see Mary's response. God's will revealed and Mary's response. First of all, here in our, in our chapter, chapter 1, verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. So the first thing we see is when God wants us to know his will, he makes it apparent. He makes it obvious. He tells us. He shows us in some way what his will is. And here he sends a messenger specifically to announce his will. Gabriel comes to announce God's will to Mary. 
Now remember, she lives in a place called Nazareth, which is an unknown crossroads, somewhere out in Galilee, what we would say, out in the boonies. But we can take great confidence in the fact that God knew where her address was. Better than her postman did. And he knows where you live. And he will not allow you to miss his will if you're seeking for it. Sometimes we get worried. Wow, what if I miss God's will? You won't miss it if you're looking for it, if you're seeking it. And even if you're not, he can make it apparent to you. Because Mary obviously was not expecting this. But he sends a messenger to her. I grew up in the little crossroads. It wasn't even a hamlet, I guess, of Franklin Forks, Pennsylvania. If you're driving down Route 29 going north from Montrose, Pennsylvania, seven miles out you come to a crossroads. The only way you know there's anything there is because there's a gas station. Right? I lived up the street a little bit in the midst of a bunch of dairy farms. The biggest event in our neighborhood was the July 4th parade, which lasted for about five minutes. And then we would all go to the ballpark and have the best barbecued chicken that you've ever had. But we were out there in obscure, rural Pennsylvania. But you know what? God knew where I lived. God was working in my life. God caused my grandmother to break her hip when she was 65, or allowed her to, I guess I should say, so that she was moved down to live next door to us on our property in a mobile home so that I would grow up with a, with a godly grandmother right next door who, as I've told you before, every time I went to visit her, it was time for devotions. And she had three or four devotional books, so it didn't matter what time it was, because she did one early and one later on in the morning, one in the afternoon, one at night. I mean, she, had, she was always doing it, right? But God knew where I lived, and he knew exactly what I needed, and he kept inputting into my life. And it was my grandmother who, who, when I was at the age of six, led me to know Christ as my personal Savior, as she discussed John 3.16 with me as she was babysitting us, right? God knows where we are. He sends just the right messenger because God is an excellent communicator. He knows where we live. He knows how to reach us. The problem is we're not good listeners. God's talking. He's given us this message that's in black and white. Right? God's a good communicator. He knows how to explain things to us. But sometimes, even though we have this book right in our house, we still feel like we don't know what God wants for us. So first of all, we see your God sent his messenger. Secondly, we see in verses 28 through 30 that God chose to favor Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by the statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. And then the angel told her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. A favored woman. The Lord was with her. What an awesome thing. Really all that matters in life is if you have God's favor or not. If you have God's approval on your life, that's all that matters. God is with you. If God's with you, no matter where you are, you have everything you need. And the world gets so confused on that thing, obviously they don't know the Lord personally. And they think they have to have all these different things to be happy. If you didn't get anything else today at Christmas, just knowing that we have a God who knows us, he knows where we live, he loves us, he's communicated with us, would be enough, wouldn't it? He's such a great God. The Bible in the Old Testament tells us in Genesis that Noah found favor with God. He built an ark and God saved him alive. We know in Genesis 39 that, that the Bible says over and over again that the Lord was with Joseph. You say, how could the Lord have been with Joseph? His brothers sell him into slavery. Then he gets in Egypt and becomes a slave. And then he gets accused of things he didn't do. And then he gets cast into prison. How was the Lord with him? But repeatedly in that story, it says over and over again, the Lord was with Joseph. And then one day, God brings him up out of the pit. And he becomes second in charge of all Egypt. So that, even though his brothers meant it for evil, God meant it for good so he could save them alive. See, God knows what he's doing. He knows what we need. He shows favor on whom he will show favor. Romans 9, 15 says, I will show favor to whom I will show favor, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. So the conclusion here to Mary in verse 30 is, don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid. If God has shown favor on you, if God has chosen you and saved you and put you into his family, why would we be afraid? Don't be afraid. Third thing we see is God picked Mary to be the mother of God. Called Jesus, verses 31 through 33. It says, now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of, of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Now, the Jewish women were all hoping that they would be the mother of the Messiah. They were wondering who would be the mother of the coming Messiah. Who would be the Son of the Most High? Who would be the, the I mean, the mother of the, of the Son of the Most High? And who would be the mother of the one who would sit on the throne of, her, of his father David? And who would be the mother of the one who would reign over the house of Jacob forever? And who would be the mother of the Holy One of the Son of God? Verse 35. Would it be some princess who would carry in her womb this greatest treasure of all? No, it turns out that it's a common maiden. Still a virgin? pledged to be the wife of a common carpenter. And again, we're reminded that God uses everyday normal people to do his work. And I'm so thankful for that because I'm as common everyday people as you get. But God still chooses to use us because he's the one that does the work. It's God. And God chose Mary to be the mother of God. God also causes the virgin to conceive in verse 34. Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relationships with a man? I've not known a man. And God says it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that answer, it gives a lot of room for questions. But Mary understood this, that the conception would result from a divine, not a human act. And that's all she, didn't, that's all she needed to know. She didn't understand, she couldn't understand. But Mary believed and submitted. God graciously gave her some support from another family, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who were experiencing this supernatural birth as well. They were the only other people that heard from God. They were the only other people that really understood what was going on here. And it says in verse 37, for with God, nothing, for, for nothing, excuse me, will be impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, I don't know how you're going to do that. It doesn't matter if you know how he's going to do it. Nothing is impossible with God. We can take that home. We can count on that. We can have confidence in that. That's the kind of God that we serve. Nothing is impossible with God. Gamaliel wisely said when the Sanhedrin was looking to punish the disciples, for if this plan or this work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Listen, if God's doing it, if God's in it, it's going to happen. Right? When you were saved, God did a miraculous work in your life, and now you can't get away from him. God saved you, and you are one of his. And you can't change that. Praise the Lord. You can't lose it. That's the kind of God we serve. So that was God's will revealed to Mary. Now let's look quickly at Mary's response in verses 38 through 46. Now remember, Mary was a young girl. She was betrothed, as King James says, or engaged to Joseph. She was still a virgin, and she was living in a very remote and despised place, Nazareth in Galilee. Now betrothal or engagement was part of a two-stage wedding process. You probably know this, the first stage involved the formal witnessed agreement to marry and a financial exchange of the bride price. And at this point, they were engaged, betrothed, and the woman legally belonged to the groom and was referred to as his wife. And then there's this period of generally a year, and then they come together for a marriage ceremony, and then the husband takes his wife home. So they're in this engagement period betrothal period where in the Jewish economy she's looked at as being legally his wife and that's why Joseph was considering divorce when all this came down. So that's what the betrothed part means. She was from this very remote and despised place and 
As far as the Jews were concerned, Jerusalem is the center of their religion and the center of all religious activity. It took place in Jerusalem. So the closer you were to Jerusalem, the better. The further away you were from Jerusalem, the dirtier you were considered. So of course, choosing a girl from Nazareth to be the mother of Jesus would be unthinkable in the Jewish mindset. How could that happen? It is, however, a commentary on the rottenness of the religious system of that day. In fact, the whole system of Judaism was bad to the core. Now, also in this passage, there's nothing particular, particular that's pointed out about Mary. As you read the story, you don't go, oh, that makes sense. That's why he picked her. Right? There's nothing like that in this story. It's like, why, why Mary? And the Bible doesn't really tell us why Mary, but we see that her response to God and his plan and how she uh, listened to him when he, when he sent this messenger and it reveals a lot about her to us. Because when Jesus had a plan, when, G when God had a plan, and when he has a plan for our lives, he expects us to fo follow it. And here we find a girl who was willing to do that. Jesus came and completely changed her life. And this is the response of a true believer. It's a response of a person who's been given grace. Listen, when God comes to you, comes to you through the word of God and, and exposes something in your life or, or leads you in some direction or, or you're and you're understanding that God's moving in your heart to do something for him, the response of a true believer is to simply submit and obey. That's what we should do. We struggle with that, right? So three things we see about Mary. First of all, she submitted to God's plan. Verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Now understand, there was no possible explanation for what was going to take place here. A virgin conceiving, apart from having a relationship with a man, the only explanation was adultery. She would certainly be misunderstood, even by Joseph. And the community was going to slander her and malign her for what was taking place. Because in God's economy, sometimes good things look bad. Things happen to us, and we think it's bad. But in God's economy, it's good. And sometimes we can't see past what's really happening in our lives right now. But in the big picture, God knows exactly what he's doing, right? We can take confidence in that. God's in charge. God's in control. Elizabeth was going to throw off the reproach that she had because she'd been barren all those years. But now young Mary was going to start suffering reproach for the first time. Why? Simply because God chose her to be the mother of Jesus. And she was submitting to his will. And because of that, she was going to become a reproach. You say, I thought when I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior, everything was going to get better. Well, it does on one level. <laughs> but there's another level in life where it gets hard. Right? And that's what's happening here in Mary's life. It's, it's about to get hard. It's going to get hard. But look what her response is. I am the Lord's servant. King James says handmaiden. It's the word that means a female slave. And in fact, it's the lowest position in a household. In total humility, she says, I'm just the lowest of low, Lord. I'm, I'm your servant. I have no rights. Who am I to say what I should do? That's her attitude. Regardless of what the cost is, I am willing to do it. What an example Mary is to us of how we should respond to God. When God intervenes and interacts with us, and when he, when he says, this is what I want for your life, and this is what I'm bringing into your life, and we're like, no way, that's not going to happen. I could never go through that. But in this case, Mary says, yes, Lord. I'm willing to do whatever it is you want me to do. May it be done according to your word, or we might say, as you wish. You ever wonder what would have happened if Mary had responded like Jonah? No, God, I can't do this. Because God didn't say, would you like to be the mother of Jesus? He said, you will conceive. 
Today, people might say things like, this isn't fair. This is my body. I should have a choice. But Mary didn't say that. Thankfully, she said, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. Wow, if all of us in this room this morning would have that attitude to God, God, whatever it takes, whatever you want to do, I'm your servant. Do it according to your word, Lord. What a difference it would make, right? It solves all the issues about making decisions, really. You know, when God, when God presents something to you, convicts you, points you in a direction, and you're wrestling with that, well, should I do this or not? You know, if we take away this, should I do this or not, and change it to whatever your will is, God, I'm willing to do it, it gives you a freedom. There's a real freedom there. And it doesn't mean when you submit to God that he's going to immediately send you to Africa somewhere to be a missionary. Whatever God wants you to do will be his will for your life. And when you're in the center of God's will, it's the best place you can be, right? So Mary submits to God's plan. Secondly, she believes God's word. Verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. She believed God's word. She had faith that God could do the impossible. Listen, we've got to get our eyes off of ourselves. Because whenever I put my eyes on myself, I can start getting depressed and discouraged, and I can start wondering, oh, can I ever get through this, or can I ever do this? You know, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about my gifts and my talent. I have exactly all the equipment that God chose for me to have. And he's going to take it and use it however he wants to. And you have whatever gifts that God wants you to have. And all he's saying is, Lord, I mean, to you is just be available. Just be available and take what you have and use it for me. And I'll do the rest. I'll make it work. And so she believed that God could do the impossible. She had enough faith to willingly accept the risks. She had enough faith to watch her life get turned upside down. It wasn't her plan, but it was God's plan. And blessings come to those who believe God's word. Because God always does what he says he will do. He's trustworthy. He is the truth. I love the story in the book of 1 Kings where Elijah is in the midst of that famine in the land and the creek dries up and he goes down to the widow of Zarephath and she comes out and she has just enough oil and just enough flour to make a little cake that she's going to give to her son and herself before they die. And Elijah says, Elijah says, make one for me first and then go do that. God will take care of you. Can you imagine if someone said that to you? I got enough to make one little cake, one little, one little loaf of bread and, and this guy wants it. <laughs> what am I going to do? And you know, this, I mean, you may know the story, but the story is she took the risk and she fed Elijah first, believing that God would provide for her, and the flour and the oil never ran out to the end of the famine. Listen, God can do the impossible. Those stories in the Old Testament that we read, we're like, wow, even in the New Testament. You say, that couldn't be possible. And it's true, that couldn't be possible unless there was a God who could do the impossible involved in the process. But that's who we serve, because God came. And he intervened in our lives, and he's done a work, and he's continuing to do impossible things in our lives and around us today. So she believed God, and thirdly, she magnified the Lord in verse 46. My, Mary said, my soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my, soul, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. <clears throat> you see, when you believe, when you have faith in God, that faith leads to praise. Remember when Peter stepped out of the boat and he walked on water temporarily until he started looking down, started looking at Jesus, looked down, looked at the waves, started sinking. And he said, God, please save me, and God picked him up. And then they went back to the boat and got in the boat where the other 11 were sitting very safely. What did they do then? It says they worshiped God. Listen, when you step out on faith, it will so revive and relight your Christian life, your spiritual life, that you won't be able to do anything but praise the Lord. 
The reason we're not praising God more and we're not more excited about God is because we're not stepping out by faith and we're not taking risks and we're not willing to submit to God's will and we're clinging to whatever it is in our lives that we think is safe. Peter got out of the boat. He didn't do it until God commanded him to, but when Jesus said, come, he got out of the boat. He took a step of faith. He took a risk. He, got on, he was walking in, in the water with waves and everything else going on. And they get back in the boat and they're like, they figure out this is Jesus is walking on the water as well. And the only thing they can do then is just worship. I'm telling you, if you're not praising God, and I'm not praising God very much, it's probably because we don't have a lot of faith, and we're not stepping out to follow our God. Because when you do, you'll never be bored. She's magnifying the Lord. Believers are made to glorify God. We're made to worship Part of what we're here for is we're on mission to reach people for Christ so that they can become worshipers and they can become servants. That's why we're here. We're worshipers. God has called us to be worshipers. That's why we came here on Christmas Sunday, to worship him. And that's what Mary is doing here. She says, my soul praises the greatness of the Lord. Her focus was on God, not on herself. And I want to tell you that great joy comes from having a God focus, not a me focus. And as I said, when we have a me focus, it leads us to discouragement. It leads us to depression. So what an amazing story this morning. God came. Christmas is about God coming. It's not just about some weak little baby in a manger. There was tons of those out there. Maybe not all mangers, but there's tons of babies out there. But what makes this event so unique is it was God coming and taking on human flesh to live and dwell among us, to live a perfect life, and then to take upon his shoulders the sin of the world and to bear the penalty of that sin on the cross for us. God came to rescue us, and he's still arriving to change lives forever. And this morning, if you don't have a story about how God did the impossible in your life, you can. Because the most impossible thing that he can do is save you from your sin. Some people say, yeah, God saved me. And what they mean is God saved me from some accident I was in. Or God saved me when I went through surgery. That's not what we're talking about. Salvation is when God does a supernatural, life-changing experience in your life where he forgives you of all your sins, takes away your guilt, because he's paid the penalty for you. And he gives you the opportunity to have a relationship with the holy God of the universe. It's an amazing thing. God came to make that happen. And as believers this morning, our responsibility is to follow Mary here in submitting to God, believing God, and praising God. You say, what does God expect from me? Well, those are at least three things that God expects. You know, in James, it says, submit to God, <clears throat> and then the devil will flee from you. It's about submitting to God and his will first. And when we place ourselves under his authority, and when we trust him to do the impossible, and when we're praising him with our life, then we're really living. Because that's what really living is all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for this example of the Christmas story. Thank you that you know how to communicate in such a way that we can hear you. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. Thank you for convicting us and for saving us and for the work you're doing in our lives now as you help us to grow and change. Lord, we pray if there's anyone here who's never trusted Christ as their personal Savior for their sins, that you would convict them of their need and help them to see that there is answers. And that answer comes, and all those answers come, through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes unto the Father but through him. So Lord, we thank you for your blessing on us this morning. Thank you that we can meet here like this, celebrating you, celebrating what you've done. And just uh, direct our attention now as we go to the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.